But we also found that within the region that includes Oregon, Washington, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho, um, that there were 92 accused Jesuit priests and at least 80% of them worked in native or indigenous communities um, in the Pacific Northwest and also in Alaska. Hi, I'm Scott Edingham. Thanks for joining us here in the unique Northwest. Believe it or not, there is news out there beyond coronavirus and beyond the protests for racial justice. There's news all the time, in fact, and sometimes it gets overlooked. We are not going to overlook it today because there's a lot of news on the front of clergy sex abuse that's been going on for decades at this point, and it is relevant once again in the Northwest. And joining us to talk about some of her investigations of the past few years is Emily Schwing. Thanks for joining us today, Emily. Thanks for having me, Scott. Emily, so it's kind of a homecoming for you in some respects. You used to work for Northwest Public Broadcasting and the Northwest News Network, and you've continued your work on the clergy sex abuse front, the Jesuit order, and Gonzaga University in the time since you left. So we're going to talk about your recent investigation here in a minute, but let's just back up and have you catch up what you first uncovered a year and a half ago in this investigation. Yeah, so I was looking into the Jesuit order um, in the Northwest and in Alaska, and that's where I found out about these priests who had been retired to Gonzaga University's campus, a building called the Cardinal Bea House. And we found at least 20 Jesuit priests who had been accused of clergy sex abuse. Most of them retired and have been living on the campus of Gonzaga University as far back as 1986. They were relocated in 2015. But we also found that within the region that includes Oregon, Washington, Alaska, Montana and Idaho, um, that there were 92 accused Jesuit priests and at least 80% of them worked in native or indigenous communities um, in the Pacific Northwest and also in Alaska. Uh, we also found that the number of accused Jesuits in that region is uh, 3.6 times higher than anywhere else in the United States. Um, and we found accused Jesuits had worked in more than 100 native communities in the Northwest region. Um, since the 1940s at the very least. And fast forwarding to now, a recent investigation that you broadcast uh, in collaboration with the Reveal radio program, that showed a little bit more about Gonzaga University and the number of priests who had worked with Gonzaga who had been accused of misconduct over the past uh, several decades. Uh, what, what did that look like? Yeah, so I got really interested in this because right before we put out our first investigation, the Jesuit order released a list, an updated list of credibly accused priests um, from the Oregon province of the Jesuits. Um, and there was one priest whose name was not on that list who is listed on Bishop Accountability, which is an online database that tracks priests with allegations of sexual misconduct. Um, so I started digging a little bit into Gonzaga with some of the data that we'd already gathered from Bishop Accountability. And I found that among all 27 Jesuit universities in the United States, it is Gonzaga um, in Spokane that has the highest number of priests who not only have been accused of sexual misconduct, but who've also worked on staff uh, and or faculty there since 1940. We found 10 priests with credible accusations at Gonzaga. One is a diocesan priest and nine are Jesuits. We also found that there have been at least five lawsuits filed since 2004. All five of them originally named Gonzaga as a defendant. Um, also, all those lawsuits uh, allege sexual misconduct by priests associated with the university. All right, and let's dive into one of those priests in particular. His name is Brad Reynolds. He worked at Gonzaga in various capacities uh, over some years. Tell us about Brad Reynolds, what he's accused of, and where is he now? So Father Reynolds has been a Jesuit for many years. He would come and go from Alaska, but he was never officially assigned to work in Alaska. He visited a lot of villages. He's an amateur photographer and a writer. He would take pictures of village life in Alaska Native villages. And some of those photos and some of his writing were published in an article in National Geographic in 1990. Then in 2008, a lawsuit was filed against him. He is alleged to have sexually abused two boys between 1999 and 2000. And there are two other survivors who allege abuse earlier than that. Father Reynolds was put on administrative leave um, and he was investigated by the Jesuit order. However, the Jesuit order simply says that they found that the allegations against 
against him are not credible, but they won't give us details on how they came to draw those conclusions. We do know that when the Oregon province of the Jesuits filed for bankruptcy in 2009, the allegations of sexual abuse that were made in hundreds of lawsuits were sort of wrapped up into that bankruptcy process. The bankruptcy case was settled in 2011, and the four survivors who allege abuse by Father Reynolds are receiving payments from that bankruptcy settlement. A year later in 2012, after that settlement, uh, Father Reynolds was assigned to work as the Assistant Director of Mission and Ministry at Gonzaga University, where he ministered to students, offered them spiritual guidance, took them on retreats, um, and he worked there until the end of the school year in 2019, when he quietly left. We do not know why. There was no announcement made. Um, but he was a really loved priest. I mean, he even gave the commencement blessing in 2018. So as a part of your most recent investigation, you also looked at another story involving the accusations uh, against Father Bruno Sagata, who's not a Jesuit, but he was affiliated with Gonzaga University, and he's also a diocesan priest uh, in the Boise Diocese in Idaho. So tell us about his affiliation with Gonzaga and what the accusation is with Bruno Sagata, someone who I might even say is so revered, I, I guess is the right word, that he has a flight of wines named after him in Walla Walla. And a tasting room as well. There's a winery that's owned and operated by Gonzaga alum who attended Gonzaga's famed, I might say, study abroad program in Florence, Italy. And that's where he met Father Sagata. Bruno Sagata was a art professor. Um, he's Italian. He taught for Gonzaga University's study abroad program in Florence from 1982 um, until about 2009. Um, a woman named Lisa Hauser, who was born and raised in Spokane, alleges that he sexually assaulted her while she was a student on that program in 1991. Um, she has tried to lodge official complaints both with Gonzaga University and the Boise Diocese in Idaho um, at least half a dozen times. Um, however, she really doesn't feel like she's gained a lot of traction. Her relationship with Gonzaga is a little bit complicated. It turns out that she is the great niece and goddaughter of Myrtle Woldson, a well-known philanthropist and businesswoman from Spokane who gave Gonzaga University most of her estate in 2014 when she died. Lisa says that when she returned from the Florence program in 1991, she wrote a letter to um, then Gonzaga University President Bernard Coughlin uh, with you know her allegations. He called her into his office. Um, she says that he told her that if she went public with her allegations, he would reveal a dark family secret that he knew. Um, and so she didn't move forward for quite some time until 2003 when she heard that there was a big dust up at the Gonzaga and Florence program that involved Father Sagada. Gonzaga's administration that year did fly to Florence, attempted to fire Father Sagada. It looks like a lot of those decisions were being made because of some behavior that had come to light. There was a senior thesis written around that time that alleged that Father Bruno encouraged promiscuity, heavy drinking, lots of partying, lots of just debaucherous behavior that is unbecoming of a Catholic priest. However, there was a huge backlash from alumni and current students, and they decided to keep Father Sagata on until 2009. Um, and to this day, there's still a scholarship funded in his name. Um, last year, it was worth just under $120,000. And what has Father Bruno Sagata said in response to the allegations? Yeah, so I did try to call um, Father Sagata back in April. Um, we briefly, very briefly spoke. Um, I told him who I was. Uh, I told him about Lisa Hauser's accusations. Um, and before I could get anything else out, he told me that it was dealt with by the diocese years ago. And then he hung up the phone. What's interesting about this, Scott, is that Lisa Hauser received email from the Boise Diocese in 2018. Um, from the Boise Diocese Chancellor and Director of Child Youth and Adult Protection. His name is Mark Raper. Uh, the email is dated September 24th, 2018, and it says that uh, she need not worry because um, 
they wanted to let her know that the bishop had received her allegations, which they considered to be credible allegations um, of sexual misconduct by Father Sagata, that he would be retired on their website, that um, there would be an announcement made from the pulpit, and that Father Sagata was no longer allowed to participate in ministry in the Boise Diocese or anywhere else. However, somewhere after that, things changed. About two and a half months after that email was sent, I found out that Father Sagata had celebrated a funeral mass. And today he is presiding over three small churches in a parish in McCall, Idaho, which is about two hours north of Boise. Because of COVID-19, they're not having public gatherings, but they are posting um, Sunday mass on on the website of the church in McCall. And um, even this past Sunday, you could see Father Sagata celebrating mass. Of course, uh, an issue within the Boise diocese, but then back to Gonzaga to wrap it up. You mentioned earlier that they had not really been very responsive to you and your multiple requests over several years to talk with them, especially with President Thane McCullough. Anything beyond that? What have they generally said in response, done in response, said to other news media? We'll just remember that uh, after your first investigation of a year and a half ago came out, two high-ranking Gonzaga officials resigned. Anything beyond that has happened? So last spring in April of 2019, Gonzaga announced that they had established a commission that would look into how the university can best respond to the clergy sex abuse crisis at large. I have requested a number of times interviews with the co-chairs on that commission. I've also asked about what the goals are for that commission. Um, I've been turned down for interviews, and I also um, really have not been provided with any sort of clarity on what the commission aims to do. Um, with respect to this latest story that we've put out, um, Gonzaga issued uh, what I would consider a pretty canned statement. It's less than 10 sentences um, that basically says they're deeply sorry for the pain experienced by all survivors of sexual misconduct, um, that the dignity of every individual is central to the mission and values of Gonzaga University, um, but they really have not said anything beyond uh, beyond that about um, their ties to both Father Brad Reynolds or Father Bruno Sagata um, and what they may choose to do in response in the future. Well, Emily, it's very good and thorough reporting. We thank you for doing it over the course of several years, and we thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. I really appreciate it. And continuing on this topic, we turn to a reporter based in California, but whose recent reporting on this topic is very relevant to Central Washington and the Yakima Valley. Thank you for joining us today, Alex Hall of KQED. Thanks for having me. So Alex, your reporting on this topic of clergy sex abuse is centered around a priest named Father Antonio Castaneda, who is based in California now, but who previously was in the Yakima Diocese of Central Washington in the Catholic Church. Tell us a little bit more about the story of Father Antonio, as he's known, in Yakima. Jesus Antonio Castaneda Serna, better known to parishioners as Father Antonio, was a Catholic priest at a small rural parish in Cowichi called St. Juan Diego from about 2003 to 2005. And towards the end of 2005, the Yakima Diocese placed him on administrative leave while they looked into a complaint that he had shared something that he had learned in confession. He eventually resigned and became an Anglican priest here in Fresno. And um, according to an internal memo that we were able to obtain in the process of reporting this investigation, a private investigator that was hired by the Yakima Diocese looked into an allegation by a former church volunteer. The memo documents a conversation between uh, the private investigator and the man um, who said that uh, he had a bad experience with Father Antonio, that Father Antonio tried to be sexually aggressive with him, and that uh, he believed that Father Antonio abused his power. He goes on to outline in detail an incident that he said had occurred in which the man says that he at that time had discovered a tumor in his testicle 
had gone and seen a doctor. He was concerned about it and had mentioned it to Father Antonio. And he said that Father Antonio asked to see the tumor. And the man said that he told Father Antonio that he had already seen a doctor, to which he says Castaneda replied, um, I am a doctor and I'm responsible for your health and you must let me see it. The memo goes on to outline um, how the man told the investigator that um, Castaneda had touched him, touched his genitals all over, and that eventually he said everything looked okay, and that um, the man told the investigator that he was very upset and asked Father Antonio if he was happy. Okay, so Father Antonio is based in the Yakima Valley in the Yakima Diocese, and he eventually goes to California, like you've talked about. When he goes there, he tries to join the Anglican Church, and in the process of doing so, the Anglican officials there reach out to people in Yakima diocese and try to learn more about his past and his background. What did they ask? What was sort of the communication between the Anglican church and the Catholic church? Right. So in 2007, this is a couple of years after Antonio Castaneda is placed on administrative leave, he applies to be received as a priest uh, into the Anglican Church. And the local Anglican Diocese here in Fresno is the Anglican Diocese of San Joaquin. So the Anglican Diocese hires a company to conduct a background check on Castaneda. And so that company sends a questionnaire to the Yakima Diocese asking a series of questions. The bishop at the time in Yakima responds saying that he is unable to fill out the questionnaire, but that Castaneda was dismissed for quote, substantive and grave reasons. Leadership at the Yakima Diocese learns that the Anglican Diocese here is moving forward with receiving Father Antonio into the priesthood anyway. And the Yakima Diocese contacts Fresno again and basically further clarifies the reasons why they were not able to fill out that questionnaire. And they basically further clarify and say, Father Antonio was accused of violating the seal of confession. Years later, the Yakima Diocese notifies the Anglican Diocese here in Fresno that an allegation um, surfaced that Father Antonio had inappropriately touched the genitals of a young adult male under his pastoral care. Um, while serving as pastor of St. Juan Diego. In those letters, it appears to show that Castaneda traveled to Yakima, but perhaps did not meet with the private investigator. Ultimately, Bishop John David Schofield, who was the bishop here at the Anglican Diocese in Fresno at the time, writes to Yakima and says, you know, I've spoken with Father Antonio and to the best of my ability, it appears that uh, he has been wrongly accused. Okay, so fast forward then a couple of years then after he's been in California a while. He's joined the Anglican Church. Then you start looking into these allegations. So there's more allegations during his time in California. I just wonder, how did you come across the story and how did you start looking into this uh, several years later? Yeah, so last year, um, this was a time when there was a lot of media attention on allegations of sexual misconduct um, regarding you know, multiple priests of um, the Catholic Diocese of Fresno. There were roughly eight or so priests that were on administrative leave at the time. And I was reporting on a, a priest in Bakersfield, Craig Harrison. Several um, accusers had come forward alleging the various accusations of sexual misconduct. And I was reporting on that at the time and speaking with sources and advocates, including those with SNAP, Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests. And I got talking with one board member of SNAP who was saying that the members of their organization were especially concerned about the Latino community in the Central Valley. And that they were asking themselves, you know, are we doing enough to reach this community? We don't really have a lot of members of our, our, our organization who speak Spanish. Um, and at the time, you know, you could see a lot of the people who were coming forward and making these allegations were of a similar demographic. A lot of the accusers were, you know, of course now adults, but at the time were um, teenagers from um, rural communities, immigrant parents, low income households where, you know, according to the, the stories that they were telling, um, the priest was being uh, very helpful to the family in some way. And so it kind of just was on my radar to kind of look into how is this community being impacted by, um, you know, alleged priest sex abuse and kind of struck me as interesting that I hadn't really seen any reporting on, on this community as much as others when it comes to um, reporting on priest sex abuse. 
Um, and so this board member of SNAP pointed me to Antonio Castaneda's case. He was actually arrested um, when I was in Mexico on a fellowship, so I didn't um, read about it until um, later, but I started going to his court hearings. And um, it was very, very interesting because being in the courtroom with Antonio Castaneda, you know, this is Fresno Superior Court. So these are pre-preliminary hearings. It's very early on in the process, but you know, there's defendants in custody, out of custody, DAs, uh, public defenders running around. It's a very chaotic scene. It's not like one person's case at a time. Um, so I didn't really know who was there to see which case, um, but Antonio Castaneda is called up. You know, he has whatever interaction he needs to have with uh, the judge. And when he's dismissed, about half the courtroom emptied out because almost everyone was there to support him. He had a huge entourage of supporters who were just so happy and supportive of him. And it struck me as very interesting that, you know, here's a guy who has been criminally charged with 22 counts of battery, sexual battery, attempted sexual battery, and attempted to dissuade a witness. And he is wildly popular. And so I was fascinated and I wanted to find out, you know, what was it that actually happened here? You know, if, if these people are so convinced that he really is innocent, you know, why would Fresno PD think that there's enough evidence to arrest him? And so um, I reached out to his attorney who put me in touch with um, a woman who is uh, the wife of his current assistant. Um, and I started texting her and she said, come to mass, we have nothing to hide. And they were very generous with the access that they gave me. And that eventually changed after I um, had an interview with the Archbishop of um, his current, uh, the organization that uh, his current church belongs to. Um, and that's when things um, kind of change in the reporting process. But um, that's, that's how I got uh, turned on to the story. Yeah, I want to ask about that, the current church, because he's essentially been kicked out of or defrocked from the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church. And he's now saying, uh, or he's participating in the services and is a clergy of, let me get it right, uh, the World Communion of Christian Celtic Convergence Churches. It's a little bit of a mouthful. What have they said about why they ordained him, knowing that there was these allegations from two previous churches? The Archbishop of that of North America for the church is a man named Bruce Taylor, and I was able to speak with him at length. He basically said that, you know, this is a nation of laws and a country where defendants are innocent until proven guilty. As far as he is concerned, Antonio Castaneda is innocent until proven guilty by a jury of his peers. It was really interesting because... Um, you know, in my reporting, I did speak with the current bishop of the Anglican Diocese here, Bishop Eric Meniz, who said that when he confronted Antonio Castaneda with the allegations um, here in Fresno, that um, Castaneda um, did not deny the allegations, that he said he had learned this healing ministry in India. And when I talked to Taylor, he said, you know, perhaps that there was a language barrier. You know, Father Antonio is Colombian. He's a native Spanish speaker. English is not his first language. You know, perhaps he didn't understand what he was admitting to. And he also pointed to an argument that I've heard often from a lot of Father Antonio's followers, which is that we don't know the immigration status of every one of the alleged victims, but we do know that, that some, if not most, are non-citizens. And so a lot of the supporters have said that, you know, maybe people are making up lies because they want papers. You know, they're trying to get a U visa, which is a visa that you can get if you cooperate with law enforcement and prosecuting a case. And so that was one of the things that, that Taylor said is that, you know, that could be a motivating um, factor for these alleged victims that, you know, they're making these false accusations against Father Antonio because they want to obtain legal status in the U.S. And so you mentioned that Father Antonio Castaneda had you know, said this about the language barrier as a potential, you know, thing uh, intervening in the case and, and the allegations. But I just wonder, has he said anything to you directly or did he say anything maybe through a lawyer about the allegations against him? Yeah, so I don't know if Castaneda has said, I didn't understand what I was admitting to. Um, I know that the bishop here, Eric Mini, said that he worked with Father Antonio to draft a statement and the bishop said that later on, 
uh, and that the statement was admitting to some of what was alleged. And um, Bishop Manise said that later on, Father Antonio retracted that, that statement. Um, but Casaneda has denied all allegations through his attorney. The Yakima Diocese has said they did everything that they could to warn church officials here in Fresno. One of the things that stuck out to me that the chancellor said was that he said, I can't imagine the Yakima Diocese having the resources to follow Father Antonio around with a sign saying, don't go near this man. Also with the Anglican Diocese here in Fresno, um, Bishop Meniz, um, from what he told us, from what the police records appear to show, he notified police right away and has connected um, the alleged victims uh, with, with a counselor who's still working with them. Well, it's good information and it's thorough and very excellent reporting. And we thank you, Alex Hall, for joining us to share it with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. You can see more on this story and the full half hour radio special at KQED. Dot org. You can see more of Emily's work on these investigations at revealnews.org. And for more Northwest news, come to our website, nwpb.org. Thank you for joining us here in the unique Northwest. <music>